my great pleasure today to introduce you our seminar speaker today, Dr. Vero Wilhelm. And Vero is currently an associate professor at the University of New Hampshire. And he has a joint appointment in the Department of Natural Resources and Environment and in Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space. He's also co-director of the Water System Analysis Group, who works across disciplines and pursues integrated studies of hydrology and about bio biochemistry to understand environmental changes across dimensions and scales. Uh, so you guys have received my emails uh, containing the links on real CV, Google Scholar site, and Twitter account, and homepage. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very uh, evident that his values of view uh, highly cited, a highly cited, highly productive leader in the field. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have him today. Uh, to talk about a new concept he recently proposed and published, um, which is river network saturation concept to understand biogeochemical dynamics across scales. So without further ado, I will turn the stage to Will, and please join me in welcoming Will. Oh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, this is my very first time in Alabama. I've never been in the state before, so it's been a great pleasure so far. Um, I did not realize how cold it would be here when we got, when I landed in the airport. I was like, did I end up in the right city? I think I might end up in Boston instead. <laughs> but uh, fortunately for you all, it is actually snowing in Boston. Schools are closed and everything, and I'm getting yelled at by my wife because she has to snow blow the driveway. <laughs> um, but I, I get to, I get another day off from that. <laughs> first snowstorm of the year for us. Um, so yeah, so uh, I uh, thank you, Yuhan, for also inviting me. I actually got to know uh, Yuhan as we were working on this paper. It, uh, this came out of a uh, Chapman conference, an AGU Chapman conference that occurred in Puerto Rico uh, almost two years ago, I guess. And we, we got together and uh, put, this, put this paper out. So I'm going to go through what, what we're talking about with this river network saturation concept. Um, I want to acknowledge all the co-authors on this paper. So these are all people that were at this workshop. Um, as I said, it's the, uh, it's the uh, Chapman Conference, which they have these conferences on different topics, and they get people together from all over the, the world, really, uh, to work out on different ideas. And, uh, and I highly encourage you to participate in something like this at some point, if you haven't already. Um, and the paper that, that I'm going to talk about, we actually finally got published this summer in uh, Biogeochemistry. Um, and if you wanted to take a look at that, um, let me know. I can also send you a copy if, you know, I assume you can have access, you have access to it here. Um, so what are, what, what are we interested in here? So uh, I'm going to be talking about river networks. So basically they fill a watershed, they drain watersheds. Um, and basically river networks consist of all fresh waters that occur inside a watershed. Um, and we know that fresh waters influence downstream fluxes of materials. This has been known for a lot of different uh, components for quite some time. We've known it about um, sediments especially, for example. Let me see if this is, you see that? Yeah. So sediment budgets indicate that most sediments that are eroded into river networks don't get out. We've gotten similar sorts of uh, results when we look at nitrogen, that the fresh water component of the uh, nitrogen cascade is um, also retaining a lot of nitrogen. And more recently, it's also been identified for carbon, um, for di dissolved organic carbon as well as for um, inorganic carbon. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, and, you know, input output budgets is basically what we're interested in here is trying to understand of the, what gets into a river network, what is leaving that river network. Um, and this is basically ecosystem ecology, right? So we talk about input output budgets all the time for that. Um, so one of the early, I mean, I guess it's kind of early, nitrogen saturation hypothesis is something similar that has long been proposed for, uh, for forest ecosystems uh, to try to understand how much nitrogen is leaching from forests of different age. Um, and we, we've, you know, basically we've also looked at that in terms of uh, streams as well. Sorry, I'm trying to still get used to the pointer here. Uh, the difference with forests is that um, the internal cycling is often uh, much 
faster or more quantitatively significant than the inputs and outputs, which is different than streams, where inputs and outputs generally are much greater than, uh, than the internal cycling of nutrients. So we already are thinking about it a little bit differently when it comes to, to stream networks. Um, the other question with streams is there, what is the actual boundary of the ecosystem? And this is another concept that has been long in uh, the literature. So in soils, for example, you're going from, this, from the organic soils and then you're working way, way down, but it's a patch that's fairly um, you know, contained. It's not interacting with other patches neighboring it for the most part. Um, but in stream systems, it really, you, you have to sort of be, you're much more connected because you have this advective flux. You have a net flow downstream. So uh, this has also been a concept that's been long in the literature of going from headwaters to large rivers and how the dynamics change as you do that, as you go down there. But what we are thinking about in this particular analysis is, is uh, basically applying those concepts to the entire river network. And here's just a conceptual model of a river network where you know, you're draining all the land, this is the watershed, and you go from small first order streams that combine to second and all the way down to the basin mouth. Um, what's, what becomes different is kind of a meta ecosystem then. It's about how different ecosystems are linked to one another. And so you have to think about you know, how, are, how is material getting into the river network? Where is it coming in? Is it coming in mostly in the smaller streams or is it coming in in the larger rivers? Um, and then, you know, what are the reactivities? You know, how biologically active are all these different components? Um, how connected is it? You know, what's the flow condition? And then, how does upstream processing influence downstream processing? Because upstream is going to uh, determine, in part, what gets downstream. And then all that is also within the hydrological variability. Um, you know, because river systems are just really variable in time with storm events and seasonality and all that. So we tried to put that all together uh, to try to understand, this is from a, some, from a paper that we did a, uh, I did a while ago that just kind of started to look at this idea of you know, how does, uh, if flow varies, how effective are river networks at removing nitrogen in this case? And this is a typical shape of a curve that, um, that we, we look at. So if you have a lot of your flows are, are pretty small, then there's a high effectiveness. And if it's very large, then there's a low effectiveness. And that's um, becoming uh, an important issue as well because uh, the, the flashiness of different watersheds is changing. Uh, the flow regimes are changing in part due to climate variability, but also <coughs> due to human activities in watersheds like urbanization and agricultural activity. This is just showing a, um, a plot of the different regions of the country and what the change in, uh, in extreme events is. So how often do we get high, really short, intense rain events? And, New England actually becomes, is, is one of the highest in, in this study, which is already kind of old, but a 71% increase in extreme events in New England. So we really want to know, are we spending more time down in this part of the flow regime or, or in this part of the flow regime and how that changes? So, so this uh, river network, oh, so one more thing is that, um, and we've seen this in, in our study, so I work at the uh, Plum Island LTER, um, LTR networks, I think you probably have heard of before, most of you. It's kind of like NEON, um, that I know that you have a, a, a site nearby, but this is where I do a lot of my work, uh, field work, and, oops, I'm sorry, I just uh, pushed the wrong button. I think I pressed pause. <laughs> Unpause. Oh, there, that's all right, okay, I gotta figure out how the buttons work. Sorry about that. Good thing you all have food so you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had uh, extreme high flow. Our, uh, we've had USGS gauge in our watershed since uh, 1934. And we have had the record high flow occurred in 2006, the highest ever, uh, which is in this, uh, the bottom right here. Um, and then we had uh, the record low flow uh, just a couple years ago where there was no water over this dam at all. Um, and so we, we're seeing some of these extremes. And so trying to understand the dynamics of, uh, of, of river networks um, and how they may, might change under future climates is, is pretty important for us, we think. Okay, so what are, what are we trying to do here? And it's actually um, fairly simple. Um, it's, it's actually very simple. Is the idea is that um, 
we put everything in a discharge space here. So we're going to put discharge, kind of ignore concentration for now, um, focus on discharge. So as, as flow in a river network increases, um, the supply of a constituent, any kind of theoretical constituent, is going to increase. Even if it dilutes, on average, I mean, I think almost all the time, you get more coming in during a storm because the dilution is never as much as the increase in flow. You have many orders of magnitude of increase in flow and maybe factors of dilution at the most. So your supply is always going to increase. Um, and then the question is, well, what about the demand of the entire river network? You can imagine two scenarios here. One is where, you know, there's no, uh, that, that material is already uh, plenty of it available and there's no uh, source limitation. So there's actually no response, right? It's already at the maximum of what it needs. Um, but we think that in, in a lot of cases there is some source limitation so that initially the demand increases and then saturates at some, at some higher rate of supply. So the, the thing that's um, kind of useful here is that you know, we can think about supply and demand um, for any kind of constituent. Um, it can be for something like chloride, right, which is mostly conservative in, uh, in water systems, in, in rivers and lakes. Basically, we use chloride as a conservative tracer most of the time in our experiments because it's not being removed. So you would expect chloride to follow something like this, right? It doesn't respond to changes in supply. Whereas nutrients might follow something like that. But it can be applied to carbon as well. It can also be applied to pathogens if they're coming into the river system, uh, how much of those are transported, how much is decaying in the system. Um, same with sediments, yeah. Very good question, uh, So on the x-axis, we have the discharge, even if uh, the system is uh, not source limited, uh, the transport capacity varies with respect to the discharge. Yeah. Why you say are saying that it has to be constant? Uh, that there's no, there's no demand for that. So this is, this is meant to be a demand for that nutrient. In the river system? In the river system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is all now already at the network scale. So we're thinking about the set of uh, water bodies in, um, in a river network. All right. I'll, hopefully it'll make more sense as I, as I go through. Um, and so we can think about demand as in, a, in a general way. Again, this is aquatic demand. And you can imagine for these different kinds of constituents, um, you know, there's uptake, which is assimilation. You could have dissimil dissimilatory processes like denitrification, but you can also have things like settling or transformation from one form to another. And in terms of gases, it could be just the loss of the gas to the atmosphere. So this conceptual framework is about the balance of supply and demand at network scales and requires a network uh, perspective. And it really is building on uh, some, you know, a lot of earlier things, including by colleagues of ours, uh, Pete Raymond proposed something focusing mostly on pulse, a pulse shunt concept, which you can also read in the in the literature. So this is the uh, a figure that's in the in the recent paper. But oh, and I apologize. I don't know why. I think this is uh, one of the reasons why I should have used my computer. <laughs> um, this this sometimes happens. I apologize. Uh, kind of nonsense here, but basically this is the same thing that I showed before where there's supply and demand. Um, the pulse is when you have the, uh, uh, the increase in supply, there's some kind of processing and that which is not processed by the network is shunted downstream. Um, and when you look at the proportion that's removed by the network, it follows this pattern that I introduced earlier where you have this um, basically S-shaped curve. And the balance then uh, determines then whether the network uh, regulates fluxes, right? And if it doesn't regulate the fluxes anymore, that's when we, that's what we call saturation. If the system is then saturated. And so the hypothesis that we are testing, and it's kind of, it's not really, um, it's not really that novel. It's just kind of a new way uh, of trying to understand it and, and applying it across general uh, situations, not just one, one form of, of solute, say. But the idea is that the capacity of an entire river network to retain, remove, or transform a constituent declines with increasing flow, okay, due to increasing imbalances between supply and demand. And the flow condition at which river network saturation occurs is a function of the reactivity of the constituent. Um, so some networks become saturated, uh, for some solutes, become saturated earlier 
in that flow change than others. And so the, the mathematical representation of this um, is, is shown here, where uh, basically this is the proportion that's removed by any given water body, and it's an exponential decay function. Um, and these terms up here are aerial uptake, length, and width. So this is the biological term, for example. This is the area that's um, uh, habitat. And then this is the discharge and the concentration, so the supply. And you know, basically, that's the demand in the numerator and the supply in the denominator. And so it's the balance of that that matters. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting, but are you considering only biological uptake and you're not considering chemical transformation? We can consider that as well. So in this case, it is. But I'll go, uh, I'm going to go into how it translates into those as well in a second. OK? So, um, and, and then, so if you consider this as demand and supply here, right? Then you can start to uh, isolate these different terms and see, well, how do things change with extreme events, for example? In this table, how does length change? You know, you can have um, the network extending into uh, smaller streams, or, you know, smaller parts of the catchment. You get, you know, how does the width of the river channel change, or how does connectivity with floodplains change? So you can go through and really break down exactly what is the change uh, that's occurring. Um, this is a table for extreme events, but I have a similar table for uh, impacts of urbanization. You can do the same thing where you know you people cover up streams and rivers in urban areas, and things become more channelized, and floodplains are disconnected, and you know things like that. So, so this kind of is a is a way to combine all these things into one uh, one picture. So here's where I, I want to get into what, why it may be relevant for other kinds of uh, processes, not just biological ones. Because if we summarize the uptake divided by concentration in uh, stream ecology, that is called the uptake velocity, which has units of meters per year. Or, or sorry, I should say length per time. Um, and you can imagine it as how quickly does the constituent travel through the water column. But that then becomes identical to a settling velocity for a particle, or it, it also becomes similar to the piston velocity for gas exchange out of the water back to the atmosphere. So if you then substitute that term as the parameter in, in here, then you can start to apply it to all kinds of different processes. And so one of the things that we did in this paper is just kind of summarizing uh, some of these different processes at, in terms of their uptake velocity, um, or, or piston velocity, or uh, settling velocity, however you want to think about it. And you can see that um, this is all standardized to this meters per year. And so for chloride, for example, we assume that it's not reactive at all. So that's just given a zero, which is actually very helpful. Um, and if you come to my talk uh, this afternoon, you'll see an application of this. So I'm giving two talks today, if you didn't know that already. Um, and then you can see that uh, the inorganic nutrients you know, can, go, can range quite a bit, uh, up to several thousand, all the way down to, for denitrification, something like 25. You know, that's, that's a typical uh, uptake velocity for denitrification. DOC ranges as well, uh, several orders of magnitude. Particles also, you know, here this is if, if you assume a calm water body, you can see how quickly those could settle out. Uh, e. coli, there's been a study on, on what those uptake velocities are. Uh, and then also gases, and it depends on, you know, how turbulent the water is and things like that. So now, you know, we see this range and so what we did for this uh, study is to see, okay, how do river networks saturate for each of these, for, for a range of these uptake velocities? So, so yeah. So this doesn't mean it's, it's removed. It could be, it could be settled and, and So yeah, so. It's not it, a mineralization. No, it, it, it could, depending on the process, like denitrification would be an actual removal. Some of these are um, temporary storage, it could be. Gases would also be removed, you know, if they evade. So you have to think about, so we're not really thinking about the recycling of the material once it's, so we're kind of thinking of it in terms of net, you know, net removal, net uptake. It can get much more complicated than what I'm talking about today, so. <laughs> and, but here's the, uh, here's the model, I'm not gonna go into it, but basically it's, it's a fairly straightforward model to look at, to apply the uptake velocity and accounting for the distribution of hydraulic loads and flow paths you know, what's the probability of a first order stream flowing into a second, then to a third, then to a fourth, or is that first order stream going into a fourth and then a seventh, you know, or something like that. It doesn't have to go 
sequentially, it can be, there, there are different probabilities. And so this model accounts for that. Um, the things that we're thinking about, the other assumptions, and this gets at your question as well, is that you know, we're assuming for, for this talk, spatially uniform loading, the stream network only, for, for this part of the talk anyway, chemostatic, no changes in concentration with discharge, demand is a net term, um, uptake velocity is constant. With, so there's a lot of assumptions in here, but it's really just to try to get at the underlying dynamics of, of, the, uh, of, of river networks. So I'll show you some of the results. Um, at this point, it's, it's mainly modeling results. I'll have one slide at the, towards the end, or se several slides towards the end that get into more of the like comparing with data. But basically what this is showing here, so all of this plot is this similar to what I showed before. This is the portion of mean annual flow. So this is the mean annual flow here. And then we look at dry conditions versus storm conditions. And this is, happens to be the storm of record in the Ipswich about uh, four, 15 times, I think. Uh, the mean annual flow is what it was. So this is an indicator then of the supply, right? And then here's the proportion that's removed. And we're looking at this removal is of the entire set of surface waters in the river network. So what you see here is that, and then, and then these are different scenarios of demand. So here we're looking at more like uh, very refractory dissolved organic carbon. This was similar to denitrification. This is similar to ammonium uptake or potentially nitrification. And you can see that um, as the demand increases, the network is actually able to, to buffer um, a lot of change in supply when the, your uptake velocity is high and is much less able to when the uptake velocity is low. Which kind of makes intuitive sense, but this kind of now lets you also think about for the process that I'm interested in, am I typically in this range or am I typically in this range? And then you can sort of get a sort of quick snapshot of how effective the river network will be at removing that constituent. So what I'm going to look at then is, uh, is trying to understand uh, one of the parts of the, uh, this idea is like understanding this flat part. So how does that, how does that actually happen in river networks? Or, you know, and, and so here, you know, the flat part is short, here it's much longer. And I'll show an example of, of each of those. Like, what do you, why do you think that happens? I guess I'll start with a question. Unsa unsaturated. unsaturated. So uh, it, when, when everything is removed at this upper part here, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So you don't reach the saturation. But how does that work in the river network? That's what I'll, I'll cover. So if you don't have <laughs> Does anyone have a, 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 a hypothesis? Maybe it's kind of obvious for some. It wasn't obvious to me. That's why. Supply is a very large demand rate. So the supply is very large. And uh, the demand rate is very uh, small. So in that case, uh, uh, so that's when you start to decline, right. right? Yeah. But then why is it so flat over this broad range of, uh, of uh, supply increase? So it's because everything is removed quickly, right? Mm -hmm. The system is, for example, very oligotrophic. Right. And when you put a lot of nutrients, it will be removed. Right, right. But there's actually a spatial component to this okay. that I'll, that's kind of what I'll talk about in this, these next slides. Is it slides. possible it's the turnover is so quick? Uh, no, because we're, we're assuming net removal. So once it's out of the water, it's gone, like denitrification. So I'll go, I'll so go into the normalizing to proportional removal. When you say proportional removal, what, are, what is the normalizing factor? In there? It's of all the inputs to the river network. So that's why I have this, this plot here. This is the entire river network. So the lands, these are, this is focused on non-point sources. And you know, they, they can enter anywhere you know, they, that it intersects with the stream. So Depending on where they are, like uh, headwaters versus uh, you're getting water yep. Because you're getting you're getting there. So again, we're assuming uh, spatial header uh, homogeneity throughout the river network. Okay, yeah. Is there going to be time in the river, like flood flow reaction interaction time or residence time? Uh huh. It has to do with residence time as well. Yeah, and it also has to do with source limitation. So let me That's let me go through the mechanism now that you've had a chance to think about it. That's what I meant by turnover residence time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Short you have long, so when you have low flow, you have long residence yeah. time. Right, yeah. So let me, let, let's, let's go into it. Um, so this is a typical, so now we're looking spatially. Um, and we're looking at, um, again, an entire river network. 
and we're looking at the different river orders. And this is a plot showing uh, a typical distribution of where non-point sources first get into the river network. And what, it, what, what it's showing you is that, for example, uh, in this entire river network, 35% of the inputs are going right into first order streams. And then about uh, maybe 25% in the second. And you can see that very little actually gets in, and this is a fourth order down here, but, um, but very little gets into the large river uh, initially uh, directly. Okay, just because, you know, that makes sense because most of the river length in a river network is in the small stream, so it's intersecting more of the landscape and therefore intercepting most of the non-point sources. So then we're going to look at, so that's the inputs, okay, that's the supply under, um, under all flow conditions at this point because it's proportional. But then um, we're going to look at um, now at, in the seventh order river network, we're going to look at a very low flow period we're going to assume um, a relatively <coughs> low uptake velocity. This is actually similar to denitrification. Um, and so here you can see that this, is the, this plot, this line will be the same on all the coming plots. And here is the proportion removal of it, the contribution of each river order to removal by the entire river network. So you can see that overall there's 99.7% of the material is being removed by the network. Okay, the headwaters are a little bit leaky, right? Because they're not removing everything that comes in. But the larger rivers are compensating for that. So the leakiness is being um, accounted, uh, compensated for by unrealized demand in the larger rivers at low flows. So basically, the low, because most of the inputs are occurring <coughs> in, the, in the headwaters, the larger rivers aren't really getting uh, everything that they could use. Okay, does that make sense uh, so far? So now we can go to 10% of the mean daily runoff. So everything else is the same, it's just the flow rates are higher. And you can see 10%. And so now you can see the difference between these two lines is much greater. So that means headwaters are very leaky now. Uh, but the larger rivers are still able to compensate most of that upstream leakage. So you still have over 90% uh, retention at the river network scale. So if you integrate under, the, under each of these curves, that gives you the percent removal okay, by the network. And you can see that the larger rivers are contributing much more to that um, network function under higher flows as flows increase. So now we go to 20% of the mean daily. Now retention is starting to, to go down, and, but and the, the headwaters are even leakier, and the, the main stem rivers, the larger rivers, are able to still compensate a lot, but they're becoming also saturated now. And we can just keep going like that for double the mean annual, and you can see that headwaters do almost nothing. Uh, any function that remains is occurring in the larger rivers. <clears throat> and then during extreme events like this, uh, we have very little removal altogether. And everything that gets into the network is moving out to the, to the water body, the receiving water body. So that's, that's for a... Um, for a low reactivity, so like denitrification. Um, here we might do something, something similar, the same kinds of scenarios where now we're at 1,000 meters per year for uptake velocity. Something like ammonium, which is highly reactive, more reactive than nitrate in, in surface waters. And actually, uh, there are two lines here, but you can't tell them apart, right? Because basically what this means is that a student, because at this uptake velocity, as soon as that constituent gets to the stream, it's snapped up and removed right away. Wherever it gets in, nothing gets out. Um, and that's actually, you know, something, well, let me, let me just do the, the next one. So now here we have uh, at double, so you can see for ammonium then, you do have leakage from the headwaters down, but we're still uh, almost near 100% removal. And then even at 20x, um, which is like a record flow, if this process rate were to remain constant during that, you would still have half of the material being removed that enters into the river network. And this is just integrating that, th those two curves um, that I showed earlier, looking at, at, at how it varies at the network scale. Um, and so this is kind of typical for nitrate, and this is kind of typical for ammonium. And what this uh, implies, this is actually consistent with what we observe in the system where nitrate does leak down stream, whereas ammonium you hardly ever measure in a, in a system that doesn't have point sources, say, like wastewater treatment plants, you hardly ever see ammonium further downstream because 
it, it's, it's just always taken up right away. Even under high flows, you don't really see, expect to see much of a response of ammonium, whereas you would for nitrate. And I think that is kind of what we tend to see in our, um, in, in our uh, streams and rivers. Um, so um, so that, that's kind of the, the basic idea of the river network saturation concept. Um, and I guess I should, I should have started my uh, timer. Let's see, I still have some time, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but then there are other scenarios where that might make it more interesting. And one of them is, um, what if you also have an increase in loading that occurs, like due to anthropogenic activity, like agriculture or urban areas? And so what we did then is um, you can apply functions of uptake velocity where it shows a decline with increasing concentration. So that VF decline has been shown it's a, a, from the LINX2 studies, which is a paper that was published by Mulholland et al. in 2008 in Nature, where they, they showed that it declines with increasing concentrations. And in that case, so for example, there are three scenarios on here, same, shape, same shapes overall, but this is with low. Loading concentration, 0.2 milligrams per liter, 1 milligram per liter, 10 milligrams per liter. And you can see how the, the network becomes saturated earlier under uh, lower flow conditions as the nutrient loading, the nutrient concentration increases. And so at mean annual scales, you can see that you go from maybe 50% retention down to 10% retention, um, and even greater effects at, at lower flows. So that's just showing you that the demand uh, is, is declining, uh, or it's not, it's increasing at a slower rate than, than the supply in, in that case. So that's, these are, so th this is just another scenario, um, but what about non-channel systems? So like, you know, most river systems have lakes, reservoirs, beaver ponds, you know, wetlands, a whole kind, a, all a, a series of, of different potential water bodies. So we did also look at this scenario too, where um, now I'm using an actual spatially distributed model. So the model before is a statistical model, uh, very useful for playing around with these things, but you can't add patches very well. So here we use an actual gridded river network model where we can add patches. So this is our, this is the Ipswich River watershed in northeastern Massachusetts, north, just north of Boston. It's actually uh, very suburban in this part of the watershed over here. Um, but much more forested in this part over here. Um, and these are showing the river, different size rivers in there. Um, and so, but we can now add the lakes. So these are the lakes from a GIS layer that we have available to us, and you can see the distribution of those. And then we also wanted to look at, uh, in our system, um, we have a fair number of lakes, but we also have um, beaver ponds coming back. So the beaver have been uh, re were reintroduced earlier in the uh, 20th century, and now they're actually very, very abundant. We actually don't have very good handle on how many there are or their distribution, but oops. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's see. Don't know how to do it with this thing. Um, so we just made some scenarios. We just made some up um, and, and sprinkled them across the landscape where we have beaver colonies, basically 0.2 per kilometer. Um, so not, not too abundant, but we just sprinkled them around in the, in the headwaters or, or smaller streams. Um, and we looked at, uh, and, and this is the model that we use. There's basically a hydrology model for the landscape, and then we, we, uh, we then track the material through the river network in these different grid cells. Uh, and I won't go into this. This has been published on a fair amount. But then here are the results from this particular set of scenarios where, again, same, um, same axes. Again, this is uh, kind of screwed up, but this is the proportion of mean annual flow, and this is the proportion of removal by the entire river network. And here's the S4 is the channel only scenario. If we added um, the lakes, oh, it's also not labeled correctly. It, if we added the lakes, that's what is S5. Um, if we added the beaver ponds on top of the lakes, that's this S6. And then also we had a s scenario where there, we connected some hypothetical floodplains at uh, double the, the mean annual flow, and you can see that would also bump, bump it up. So these uh, more um, uh, lentic waters, sorry, that's, not, that's my screw up, that's 
should be effect of lenthic water bodies on network scale removal. Um, that only enhances the demand, okay? Um, and so, you know, it's important to try to incorporate all this to understand how different kinds of river networks are, are functioning. So if you made a big ocean out of this, it would be flat? A big ocean? Yeah. Yeah, if you had like, a, like the Great Lakes. Yeah. Uh, that would be flat then? It, it would yeah. probably be, yeah, it would probably go be pretty flat, like 100% removal. Why is that? Well, because the water stays there for so long and the building settles down. And, every, and, and potentially, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. We'll ha we would have to it, it, set something up. Yeah, residence time is infinite, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so just to, to look at some data uh, to, to identify, to sort of um, confirm that wetlands are contributing a lot in the Ipswich, um, we have here's a scenario where we look at the dissolved inorganic nitrogen concentration versus distance from a subbasin that's in this watershed that is urban up here and that enters into a, into a system that has a lot of wetlands starting around 5,000 meters. And this is what we would predict um, if we had no uh, reactivity at all. So VF equals zero in that case, this dotted line. This is what we would expect. If we then account for the channel removal, we would expect to go down here, and if we add the wetland removal, which is starting to occur here, then we, we decline much more rapidly. And this is much more consistent with what we measure in, in our, uh, when we do these transects from upstream to downstream, we sometimes have nitrate that goes to zero in, this, in these surface waters because of denitrification. So basically that confirms that the wetlands are contributing quite a bit to, to the removal in this, in this watershed. So we have one question. Yeah. So so when you have the distance, you know, from upstream or downstream, uh -huh. uh, did you consider tributaries? Like yeah. So this, so this is modeled, so it accounts for the tributaries okay. coming in, and this is basically saying that those, they're kind of all similar tributaries that join okay. to that point. They all have high nutrients, okay. so they're not diluting. Um, if we were to go further down the river network, okay. I'm not sure I'm going to show any of that. Um, then it would dilute on its own, even conservatively. Because okay. one milligram per liter is actually pretty high. You know, that's, that's a sign of urbanization for us. Okay. So yeah, it tries to account for all of that. Um, and then we also did uh, something, you know, we also did a, a series of synoptic surveys where we uh, roughly estimated the percent retention between headwaters and the main stem. And what we found there is that each of these points represents the removal of the entire river network as determined from a set of measurements collected on the same day um, for the flow conditions that occurred. And you can see that there is a decline in retention up until some kind of a flow threshold where it increased. Um, and, and that is roughly, so, and here's the model predictions based on where we connected the floodplain. And you can see that there's a rough correspondence. Obviously, it's not a, a great fit, but it, it does suggest that there's um, additional functionality that becomes available, additional demand that becomes available in the river network uh, after some flow threshold. That's another thing that we don't really have a good handle on yet that we're, we're kind of working on. So the last thing, and this is actually what I'm going to be talking a little bit more about in this afternoon's talk, so I won't go into the details, but can we, are there better ways to test these model predictions um, with observations, especially now that we can really track uh, nitrogen continuously across flow conditions. And um, basically what the black lines here, so, so we, we deployed a, a, a set of nested sensors in headwaters and at the base and mouth, and then using a sort of a mixing model approach, we could estimate what is the percent retention uh, under different storm sizes. And the, the black lines represent those observational results. The, the, the solid line is the, the mean, and the dotted line are the confidence intervals. So you can see there's a pretty broad range of uncertainty. Uh, but the point here is that we also then applied a very simple river network model that's similar to what I showed earlier. And this is what we predict occurs. Uh, just based on the simple model with all the assumptions that we've included that made, made it simpler. And we get a similar, <clears throat> I know the shapes are different, there's some issue with crossing zero, which we can talk, I'll talk about more uh, this afternoon, but, um, uh, but you're within the error. You're, you're within the, uh, the uncertainty of the, of the system. 
Um, so we were pretty happy that well the model the this model kind of works um, and is is relatively consistent with the uh, with the observations. So um, just then to sort of recap and summarize, um, th th we can generate multiple hypotheses now. So for example, in all these cases, the supply is increasing with discharge. Um, and the scenario of a non-limiting nutrient, then you would expect no demand or you know, little demand or no change in demand. This is the scenario that we focused on mostly where it, it's a limiting factor that becomes non-limiting. But you can imagine also uh, other river network responses. So if you have an extreme event, then you could um, scour the, the biota, like algae for example, or um, flush out all the organic matter or something like that, where you might expect that the, uh, the demand goes, actually goes down as the, as the flow or the supply increases. Or you can, and we played around with a scenario like this where you know, the demand actually increases at some flow because you've uh, attached new systems to, to, the, to the overall network. Or a, a system that has many large lakes um, just keeps up with that demand always. And so that's kind of some of the, I, I think um, one of the things that we could start to do is better understand how these different kinds of watersheds respond to flow events, which will be important for understanding how, say, the coastal zone responds to um, climate variability. So um, in conclusion, um, river network saturation hypothesis based on theory of aquatic ecosystem function. Uh, it's basically just a supply and demand curve um, that inherently accounts for variability of flow, which is a defining characteristic of river systems. Um, we think it can be applied to multiple constituents, which actually then lets you also think about it in terms of stoichiometry if you wanted to. Um, that it provides kind of a null, what I showed is mainly a null hypothesis, uh, because they're in real river networks, you have a lot of other factors that become important, <coughs> like, you know, what about the distribution of loading, or the network structure might vary, and sometimes there are internal sources, like, of, uh, you know, spiraling uh, ideas. What about the water column contributions to that? Not considered yet. Um, and then also, you know, what's the probability of different size storms? And um, that potentially that as these nested sensor networks uh, become more affordable uh, and more connected, that we could um, apply this kind of, uh, get empirical measurements that help us better define how river networks function and, and actually refine the models that we're using. So that's it. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. I'm sure there are lots of questions. <laughs> yeah. Can I go to that uh, figure you had, the beaver pond and, and the small lakes? Uh-huh. OK. Kind of interesting. The, the map or, the, or the, just the, the figure, yeah. This one? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah. this one. OK, yeah. Uh, that's kind of fascinating to me. Um, so as I said, if I just keep on putting more and more lakes, you're getting better and better, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So if I, if I want to solve the problem, I got to create a lot of little lakes. Yeah. Or maybe a one big lake. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's a conundrum here. Um, if we have a lot of little lakes, then there is also sediment storage. So if there's a big event, you might mobilize that thing. And yeah. Actually, it's detrimental, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile that? Um, I mean, in terms of strategy, what would be the strategy? Oh, right. So if you are actually doing it for management purposes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, reservoirs are doing that all the time, right? And they're always filling in. Um, and, and how do we manage them? We end up dredging them, right? So that material has to be taken out. Um, I mean, that, that's not a good answer, I don't think, for your question. But, but that's the kind of dynamic that occurs. Um, and so... Um, you know, the other part of that, it depends on the constituent. So for something like sediments, you know, they, eventually they probably will be no net storage anymore. <coughs> so that changes through time. Those sediments, you know, create wetlandy kind of habitats, which would actually improve the, the, the nitrogen fluxes because those uh, shallower, mm -hmm. maybe they have organic matter in there, they probably have a lot of uh, denitrification occurring. So those actually may be contributing to enhanced nitrogen removal, 
uh, in that situation, you know? Um, but I, I, I see your point. I, you know, one of the things that I've thought about is, you know, um, for urban and urban systems, you know, you get flashier. So one of the strategies is to build detention ponds that slow down um, the runoff, which would um, also slow down the delivery of nutrients, which would push the, the probability of a flow uh, level in this direction, right? You'd have fewer of these high flow events and more of these, and that's when the river network can actually remove most of it, or, or more of it, I should say. So there's a lot of dynamics that could be considered, I think, with, with your, your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in regards to the figure which you, where you showed uh, that when the floodplains get connected, uh -huh. how the, uh, were you saying that uh, there will be increasing residence time and so the removal rate will be higher? Yeah, so, so basically the, the, the way it works is like right here, so here, this is all channelized. Well, you, it's channels in those lakes. But here, the channels, the, the downstream channels go over bank and, and become connected to some kind of floodplain that's given the same uh, reactivity. So that's another assumption, right? It's given yeah, the same. That's what I was wondering, that when, when the floodplain gets connected, there can be a lot of source of uh, you know, organic or uh, mm -hmm. other minerals uh, at that time and stuff. So mm -hmm. It can lead to an increase of, uh, I mean, in, in the source. I mean, there can be a lot of. Stuff. Oh, so there could be some sources mobilized. Yeah, yeah. because uh, you know it gets connected, and uh, in the floodplain there can be a lot of organic. Right. Already. But but I think also if there's a lot of organic, then this, in more than in a channel, this actually might go up uh, when the floodplain gets connected because you're you you're connected to more. Uh, organic matter, right. and it will probably take some time to establish low DO conditions, but potentially this could actually then go up, which would cause this to spike even further up. So there's a lot of things, a lot of interesting dynamics right. that are not considered in this, but you highlight one that would be very interesting to look at. So uh, I was um, curious, like, so a lot of processes that occur at like a smaller scale, mm -hmm. and how the model is more sensitive. So just good question, uh, uh, give example, you know, so you may have, you have a supply curve look like this, right? Uh -huh. So it could be like a linear change, or it could be, you know, with different degree or order. Uh -huh. you know, the concentration depend on what you're looking at. Right. The yeah. concentration, the variation concentration vary with discharge. Right. So yeah. does I, that actually influence this result a lot? Uh so I haven't we haven't really looked at that, but I think I know what you sorry. So yeah, so this um actually probably the simpler way to put this is if this was linear, yeah, so that would no be change. no change in concentration. Yeah, concentration. This implies Flushing, yeah, right. Like a yeah, right. Yeah. And and if it's diluting, then it's you could coming. expect it to do something like that too. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's a good question. I we haven't <laughs> really looked at that. It also changes time. Uh huh. Like it depends on if you have a stop or if you don't right. have a stop. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing for the demand, uh, it's a similar question. You know, when you have demand, you could have a different shape mm -hmm. too because. Mm -hmm. um, Depending on like what pump show, depending on what constitutes right. fuel make or protein like the U.S. Right. Oh, does it change with discharge? Uh huh. Right. Yep. Do we have high discharge? Oh, so yeah. So so that would then say your reactivity would differ. Like if you're flushing in more labile material, yeah. then then the demand could actually go up. Yeah. Yeah. All of that's. I mean, it could be not. Yep. The result could be still the same. Right? Uh huh. But yep. Yeah, and, and that would be also interesting to explore in this in this kind of context. Yeah, also not looked at, you know? <laughs> so then where is this field in terms of, uh, if we want to, uh, in terms of the mechanistic formulation of these models, and if we go to uh, engage systems? Uh-huh, so. So where is this field? I mean, I'm not very much aware mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, uh, uh, this field per se. Right. So I'm wondering, like, uh, is the science already written? Uh, do we have enough data 
which can allow us to develop a mechanistic model of... Uh, I think there are people that are doing a more mechanistic model, models of this, for example, including hydrology folks, because a key part of... Um, uh, let's see if I can get there quick. Like here, um, what is controlling you is a big issue. Um, and one of the factors that's important is how much water gets into the hyperreic zone, for example. So what proportion, you know, in every in a given reach, what's actually getting down into the hyperreic zone, and what are the processes down there? And th and this is kind of assuming a mean average, like a, it, it's a reach scale estimate that subsumes all of that more mechanistic dynamic. Um, so there are some folks. Um, I can't even remember their name, but they looked at something similar in the Mississippi uh, to understand what the role of, for example, uh, hyperreic uh, zones are in nitrate removal. So I think there's, a, there's another community that's really looking at that. I don't know if that answers your question very well, though. Well, I mean, I, I've seen work on like a sparrow model where they have these coefficients of decay. Yeah. But uh, what I'm all curious about uh, from an outsider's perspective is do we know what is the rate of uh, not only settling, which depends on the particle composition mm -hmm. and such, but uh, the decomposition and the chemical kinetics and uh, yeah. do we have well, information I, on that? I think that's some of what you are actually working on. So yeah, no, um, I, I think that's where we're moving. And you can you know, make this much more complicated by incorporating those dynamics. Um, at, you know, at the river network scale, we are not very far of making it really dynamic. So for example, um, organic matter delivery to different parts of the river network are really going to control denitrification. Um, and we are s assuming just a certain denitrification based on empirical estimates. We, we don't really have a good handle on why is it what it is. Um, that's where the research is still needed, needs to be. Yeah. I'm just kind of thinking in terms of a solute transport, uh, you know, mechanism, like in terms of just simple sorption, mm -hmm. where you would, I guess you could model that as an uptake somehow, like as a removal. Mm -hmm. But if you have, I mean, reversible processes, yeah. or like the the mass transfer rate is relatively, say, slow during compared to your residence time, mm -hmm. uh, something like a downpour analysis or something, where you, yeah. you know, how would that affect? where you have a delayed then load coming back in. Right, yeah, or, and that would cause, like, if you have a storm pulse, you could be driving material in to the sediments, and then that storm pulse goes away, and then that might be leaking back again. Not considered right now. That would be, you know, getting the internal processes in there where you could have sources in the river system itself. Um, you know, the simpler uh, analogy would be, like, ammonium is actually being converted to nitrate and then continuing to flow downstream um, but you know, this is the Dom Kohler number right here, yeah. right? That is the Dom Kohler number. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and like K times residence time, yeah. you rearrange these terms and that's what that's it is. What and it's all, this, it's kind of similar to all those uh, other formulations, yeah. One more kind of question. Mm -hmm. So just follow up on Mukesh's question. So from your perspective, do you think we got um, like a decent size of data for the U, for the term U? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a lot of nitrate, maybe phosphate data, mm -hmm. and so yeah. Can you comment? Do you think we need, like, for the U, like, uh, what's the state of the community instead of like constrain how good this U is? Because you, because for nitrate or for everything, everything, yeah. Um, so I the the assumptions here. Let me see. Did I show this? Um. You know, I'm looking at, I, I think it's kind of relevant to this. Let's see. Uh, demand is a net term only. Uptake velocity is constant with flow. I don't think we have a lot of what we need to really understand the dynamics as flows increase. Mm -hmm. We don't know, like, for example, if you're scouring the algal community, then your assimilation of nitrate is going to go down after a storm. But we have no way, we don't really have that data. I don't. I haven't seen that kind of a synthesis before, or you know, like organic matter. Um, like we have some evidence in our systems when the leaves fall into the streams, that the nitrate can go really low in urban streams where it's usually very high. 
Um, but we don't, we, we don't model that kind of stuff. There was actually a recent paper by one of our co-authors, John Kazuba, um, for the, for the uh, uh, wetland-dominated watershed in Minnesota that combined DOC and nitrate. And the DOC actually influences the nitrate uptake and, uh, or the denitrification. And I think that this is where you gotta couple <coughs> the, the biogeochemistry you know, the carbon and the nitrogen dynamics along with the hydrology, and I think we're just kind of scratching at the surface. And I don't think there's any, I mean, John, th that's one of the first models I've seen that really looked at that, that interaction. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, what do you think is the reason of uh, higher uh, removal rates in lower or, uh, river order? Oh, um, because uh, when, when the flows are low, you just have a um, very, uh, high surface to volume ratio, right? So you have a lot of reactive surfaces relative to the volume of water that's moving over those surfaces in the headwaters. And because the headwaters are where most of the nutrients uh, first enter the river network, they also have a, the first crack at, at taking it out. So that's why in our, this has actually been a, somewhat of a debate in our community, are large rivers or small rivers more important? And the answer is, is both, that when, when you have relatively small supply, low flows, the headwater streams are really good at just taking everything out right away. But then once the flows increase, they get overwhelmed because you know, they, they're kind of narrow, so when the flows are low, they, they interact with the, the water interacts with the bottom, but then as the flows pass through there very quickly and it gets very deep, then there's much less influence of the biology that's coming from the bottom. Question about the groundwater surface water interaction because the word groundwater was not mentioned. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, so we account for. So we're assuming that all uh, flow paths have the same nutrient concentration. In this, uh, are you are you asking about like uh, exchange between well, flowing water and the groundwater or just, input? Just listening about. Mm -hmm. But the connectivity with the groundwater table is on the same, you know, pathway of thinking. Mm -hmm. We have very um, large events, groundwater, you know, very, very quickly connects with the stream oh, yeah. and, you know, delivers another pulse of uh -huh. um, nutrients or contaminants or right. whatever it is. Plus, we need to consider that actually these concentrations in groundwater are much higher. Yeah. Orders of magnitude right. higher. Right. So they would have large impact on your equations yeah. and mass balances. Yeah. Yeah. So from so that perspective, I thought that. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, so I think the idea would be that these curves, so uh, maybe it's easier to see in this one. Um, if groundwater is high and you dilute, then you expect your supply to not necessarily, <coughs> you know, maybe the shape of the supply would be different. Right. We also have to consider the lack of response of groundwater to, say, rain events. Because, like, uh -huh. surface water responds very quickly, but if you look at the response of groundwater to a rain very event, slow. you have a lag because, mm -hmm. you know, the vegetation. Right, right. Well, yeah, so we don't really consider that. We don't separate that out. It's part of the runoff, like terrestrial runoff, storm increases. We don't care if it's, uh, in this model that I showed, whether it's surface flow, quick flow through soils, or deeper groundwater flow paths. Because on the and other it hand, would make it more complicated. Because yeah. on the other hand, we've seen this in some systems, the biological response could be different at different times because of the timing. So when the river is very, very low during dry seasons here in Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, we still see or discharge at least at the beginning of the dry season uh -huh. from groundwater oh, delivering yeah. the nutrients, we have hot conditions, we see power problems and obstacle events, uh -huh. which are triggered by groundwater, oh, not necessarily okay. by surface water input. Right, right, right. So yeah. the timing is different and the composition of the delivered fluids is different. Uh -huh. So I think that could probably change some of it, it might, yeah. You, so, so I guess how would you expect uh, I don't know. this to, to, to change then? I mean, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a you know, hypothesis that we could potentially test with this framework right. to see yeah. how does it differ? Because like I think I said, I hope I said, this is really just a, it's almost like a null hypothesis. This is the simplest case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But reality is that yeah. you have many other dynamics. So, but then does it affect these shapes and the role of river networks? I mean, in that case, when you have high nutrients being taken up by algae, that's removing the nutrients, but then those algae are being transported yes. downstream and it's yes. a source of particulates. Yes. So then that might be what gets downstream, unless maybe you have a lake that has a long residence time and then it settles out. And you know, so there's this spiraling component too. And reactivating the later of this source. Oh yeah, and then you have mobilization of the nutrients from the lake bottom or something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I was hesitant of throwing it because I know you were just presenting the yeah. general idea of to start, we have to start from something. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I like, I mean, a lot of ideas in here could be potential proposal material, you know? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you could do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Right, the neuro questions, let's thank Leo again. Thanks for coming. <coughs>